and how those storms don't compare to the storms of life, do they? Those um, ups and downs, those times when you feel lost, those times when you feel like the floor has disappeared beneath you and you have nothing to hold on to. But this next song is going to um, talk about us holding on to the one that we can cling to even in those moments. If you would, please stand as we sing, I Am. Beautiful singing this morning. And as we were listening to that, I thought that maybe somebody was thinking we're saying we're holding on to him. Well, we can't hold on tight enough. Whatever it is you're going through, the waves are too high. The storm is too heavy. Winds are blowing too hard. We can't hold on to him. But the good news this morning is he's holding on to you. And he's not gonna, you're not going to slip out of his fingers. You're not, going to, you're not going to fall. You're not going to be destroyed. You're not going to be, you're not going to get what you deserve and what I deserve and what we all deserve. And we've come today to celebrate the reality of the great I am who is holding us and who loves us in a way that we can't even imagine. Wasn't last week, Easter Sunday, a great day? 
then we have a great day here at Faith Baptist Church. And you know, guess what? He's still alive. He's still resurrected. We're going to have a great day today because he is alive. And he is who he says he is. So good to see all of you today. And uh, let me just share just a, a, a quick need and then a couple prayer requests. And uh, the, the need we have is we have a family we're trying to help. Uh, and they, they need a, many of you have already donated or have said you'll donate furniture. But what she still needs is a queen size mattress and box springs doesn't have to be new, just needs to be in good, good condition. So if you have a queen size mattress or box spring, please see Shelly and uh, we'll make sure that they get that, okay? So we appreciate it. Pray for Tyler Powell, that is Mary Bryant's grandson. Tyler was involved in an accident and uh, he had surgery on Friday, shattered his hip, dislocated his knee and a lot of other things that are going on. Continue to be praying for Tyler, if you would, as he recuperates. And then uh, our own Buck back there, Buck Gillespie, is scheduled this Thursday for hip replacement surgery. And uh, continue to be praying for him. And I know others we need to be praying for. We've got families here, too, that uh, have recently lost loved ones. I don't want to say lost. They know exactly where those loved ones are. They're just not here on planet Earth anymore and uh, they're in heaven. So continue to be praying for all of those. We are so glad you are here today with us, and we rejoice in who he is and what he's doing in our lives. And I wanna, I'm so thankful for all of those who follow the Lord in baptism last week. And as I look around, I see many of you here again. We have had souls saved again this week, and uh, God is good to us, better than we deserve. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you and praise you. We come today to... Uh, on behalf of these that have prayer requests, these who have needs, Father, some are physical and some are emotional and some are financial. Father, you know every need, but the greatest need is our need of a Savior. Thank you, Father, for the great week we had uh, last uh, Sunday, the week that you've given us for souls that have continued to be saved for all that you do. And Father, we acknowledge it's in spite of us. It's not because of us. And Father, many have found a home here, and many, Father, have found a home for people who have given up on church. And uh, Father, may we continue to love you and love one another, walk according to your word, be faithful in sharing the word with others in our time and our resources and the blessings that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated.
I meant to do something earlier. This young man sitting up here with me, still there? Yeah, that's uh, uh, Asmil Julius Jr. This is his birthday, and he is nine years old today, and I wanted to recognize him. So, uh, Asmil, we love you, buddy. You take care, all right? All right, thank you. All right, if you would, please stand. Welcome each other to church this morning as we sing. Good morning, everyone. Oh, my goodness. Sorry about that. Got caught halfway down the aisle there. But uh, anyway, it is so good to see everyone here. And uh, now, you, you know, we can't have a pastor that lies, right? <laughs> Last week, he said that if uh, when, when we turn in the cards at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the table back there, at the desk back there, the uh, welcome desk, that anybody that didn't have a car, I would buy one for you. You guys heard that? Well, I, I, I can't make a pastor a liar, okay? So if, uh, if, if you got a, a, a gift card last week and, uh, for a car wash and you don't have a car, I went out and bought some cars this week <laughs> to be able to give you guys. And I did that just so that he wouldn't be a liar, okay? <laughs> That's what I had in mind. It may not have been what you had in mind. 
Anyway, so good to see everybody here today. Want to welcome everybody here. Uh, I do see some unfamiliar faces out there. We want to welcome our guests especially. And if, you, if that is the case for you, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. And uh, there's a card in the pew right in front of you. And if you would grab that and fill up some information on there as much as you would let us know about you. There's two ways that you can turn that in. If you don't want to speak to someone face to face, that's okay. We understand. We're gonna we're gonna uh, jump on you anyway. But uh, you, there's two boxes back there on the uh, back pews, and there's one in between the offices. You can drop that card in there, or there is a connections booth right beside the office back there. You can hand that connection card to them, and they'll give you one of those gift cards for the uh, tidal wave car wash down there. And you can, if you don't have a car, you can grab one. You can take it down there and and use it. But uh, anyway, again, we just want to welcome everyone here today. This coming Wednesday, we've got our full slate of activities going on. It starts at 7, wraps up at about 8.15. All of those things are going on on Wednesdays. Come on out and get your battery recharged uh, if, uh, if you can on Wednesday. Our April pantry needs, you can see all of those up there are toiletry items. So again, if you're at the store and have an opportunity to pick up some extra ones, drop them into the box in the back lobby back there. And uh, you can see Shelly if you have any questions uh, about our pantry, and uh, she'll fill you in on all of those uh, needs. Our ministry opportunity, again, we've announced this over the past several weeks. We've got our prayer ministry that is going on on Tuesdays. There's an opportunity in the morning and in the evening, 10 o'clock in the morning and 7 uh, in the evening. And uh, so come on out if you can avail yourself. And uh, and uh, what, a, what a powerful ministry uh, our ministry of prayer is. And uh, Mark and Wanda have uh, volunteered and stepped up and said this is what the Lord has laid upon their heart. And so come on out and join them and the others. And and, uh, and just lift up our church, our community, uh, our leaders uh, in prayer. And uh, what a special time uh, I know that will be. This coming Friday, we've got our dinner theater. And uh, that's going to be at 630. Uh, it'll be a covered dish, so you can bring the, uh, the side dishes. The church is going to be providing the chicken and the drinks. And uh, it's going to be in the uh, Family Life Center in the back. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer area uh, back there. And uh, if you want to help get set up, it's, it's at 6.30 in the evening. Come a little bit early at 4 o'clock and sh meet Shelly back in the back and help her get set up uh, for uh, the dinner part of it. And they'll have already the theater part set up. But you can help Shelly at 4 o'clock. That's this coming uh, Friday uh, if you want to come and help her. Next Sunday, the kids are going to be having their spring fling. And uh, so a lot of fun activities are going to be going on. And uh, they've been doing those throughout the year, and so they've got their next one coming up uh, next Sunday, right after the morning service. You can see all of those activities. Lunch is going to be uh, provided, and uh, we'll sugar them up with all sorts of ice cream and candies, and then we'll send them home with you. So uh, just, uh, just, uh, just a fun time, and that's for parents and children, uh, so come on out for that. The Fellowship of Christian Athletes is going to have an event, and Seth is going to be uh, heading that up for, for us, and that's going to be on Thursday, April the 18th. And that'll be from 5 until 8 in the evening. If you would love to participate or would like to participate with that, you can see Seth, uh, and he will give you all of the information on that. We've got our third fundraiser uh, for the uh, Family Life Center in the back coming up. It's going to be a lasagna dinner this time. And it's going to be on uh, Sunday, April the 21st, right after the morning service. And again, same thing as last time. You can either eat here or they will pack it up and send it home with you. And uh, I know uh, that's, uh, that's a great convenient way to be able to do it. You can see the prices for each one there. And uh, again, it's the fundraiser for our Family Life Center back in the back. We raised nearly $1,000 off of the last one. And so uh, just a, a great way to uh, feed your family and uh, support our Family Life Center back there. If you have any questions about that, you can see Debbie and she will fill you in. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby back there. And then right after the, uh, uh, the, the dinner part of it, there's going to be a uh, VBS volunteer meeting. And uh, by the way, for that, there is a white sheet in your uh, bulletin today that uh, allows you to be able to sign up where you would like to be able to volunteer uh, for our Vacation Bible School. Uh, it takes a lot of people to run that. We will have 150 to 200 kids running through here, and uh, so we need a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, parents and, and workers to be able to uh, help uh, corral that group. And uh, so any way that you can help, uh, we would love to have you participate. And that, that workers meeting is going to be right after uh, the dinner that day. And then uh, on April the 28th, right after the morning service, we've got a uh, baby shower for Michaela. And, uh, and uh, that will be right after the morning service. And um, if you want to help out with that, uh, boy, she is going to have her hands full because everybody's going to be coming to see Shelly. But uh, you can see Shelly right after the service, and, and uh, she'll give you some ideas about how you can help with that uh, baby shower uh, on the 28th. Again, we are so glad that everyone is here today. I'll be waiting out in the lobby for you to pick up your vehicle on the way out. Lord bless you. <laughs> Thanks, Biff. The Bible says in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, 22, How great are you, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you. If you would, please stand and join us one last time as we sing Nobody Like You. was practicing her song yesterday and she gave me permission to mention this so I will um, she was sharing with me how 
this song had been such a comfort to her these past few years with miscarriages and things like that. Um, some of the hardest times of her and Seth's life, I know. And um, some of the lyrics say, if I know one thing, our God is a deliverer. If I know one thing, our God is going to see us through. And this song has been a comfort for her, and I pray it will be a comfort for you this morning. This is Deliverer. Thank you, Kate. And all the music is, I know I say this every week, but it's true every week, the music is Christ-honoring. And uh, I'm glad to see you. Mary Bryant, we're glad to see you. We prayed for that grandson already in our services, so we'll keep him in prayer. Just want to just say a quick word. Had a wonderful, wonderful uh, time in Kentucky uh, with the uh, senior adults, our OK Gang. Uh, Jesse and Janice put together a great program and 17 of us went and uh, we went to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky and there we are on the Ark and there's tornadoes outside and uh, rain and uh, I don't know how, uh, Jesse, Janice, I don't know how you 
got that included for no extra money, but we had all the effects. It was, it was a 3D experience at the Ark and the Creation Museum. If you've never been to either one of those, you really need to go. A couple of years ago, uh, well, six years ago was the first time Shelly and I went, and uh, one of our grandkids who was in sixth grade said, well, Papa, maybe, uh, maybe that's how uh, God chose to create the world through evolution. And I looked over at Shelly, I said, go ahead and pack, we need to make a trip. And we took them on up and had just a great, great time. And if you haven't done it, you really need to, it's wonderful. And just to encourage you who are senior adults, and you really don't have to be a senior adult, we actually had a, somewhat a seven year old with us on the trip. And, uh, but, but when, when Jesse and Janice put together these great programs, uh, you know, you really need to avail yourselves to them, and I hope, I hope you do. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about an Easter message. And you say, Pastor, how can we be talking about an Easter message? Because what we celebrated last week, and in reality it was the, it was the day of re, uh, uh, resurrection uh, because of the timing of the Passover, but what we're going to be talking about today actually is the afternoon of Easter. This is a, an event that happens in Jesus' ministry, and uh, he has already appeared. He's appeared to the women at the tomb. He's appeared to Peter already, and now he's going to appear to two gentlemen who are leaving, uh, who are leaving Jerusalem on the way back to a place called Emmaus. Let me just ask you a question. What did you do? last Sunday afternoon after Easter. We had a great time here, 427 people. And uh, I, know, I, I know we like a big crowd, but you, you like having the elbow room today, don't you? I know you, we were packed like sardines, had about 50 in overflow and, and about 50 with children's ministry. Had a great, great day, but you like having a little extra room today. But what did you do in the afternoon? How many of you took a long nap? Raise your hand. Okay, that's all right. And uh, I heard somebody say, I don't know, I was sleeping. <laughs> and uh, how many of you are washing chocolate out of that nice uh, Easter outfit you got for your child or grandchildren? Anybody having to wash those out? Well, what was Jesus doing that afternoon? Jesus was, uh, was meeting two of his disciples who were so discouraged and so down and so confused. And I'm going to begin in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. It's a fairly lengthy portion of Scripture, but it is just, it is so, so rich as we look at this. In verse 13 of Luke chapter 24, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of those things which had happened. And so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? I love it. Anytime in the Bible when God, whether it is God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit, asks a question, he already knows the answer. And some of us have heard that. Why, what are you talking about? Why are you here? What are you doing this for? God already knows the answer. He wants us to. He wants us to, to share the reason for it. And they said to him, what things? And uh, they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping, see that little word hope? We were hoping. It wasn't a no-so hope that we have this hope in Jesus. They had, uh, they wished 
mightily that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. When they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated that he would have gone further but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us? While, we talk, while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. We are still basking in the power and in the glory of the resurrection of the living Savior. And uh, next week will be two weeks from Easter, but you know what we're going to do? We're still going to bask in the glory and in the power of the risen Savior. And we're going to do that every Sunday and we're going to do that every day of our lives because of who he is. But just from this story, I want to, I know there's a lot of detail and we could really get in and and uh, do some expository uh, adventures all through the scriptures. But I just want to give you, I want to give you three broad uh, topics uh, that we take away from this, or at least I took away from this this week, as we look at how does the resurrection transform us. Yes, it transformed Jesus from death to life, yes, but how does it transform you and I? We almost might say, like we did last week, oh, it's, it was Easter again. We had another resurrection. We had another family uh, uh, get-together. We had a nice meal. We dressed up, and uh, we saw a family. We had a little bit of a reunion there. But what does the resurrection mean to you and I? It is the transformation that comes with this resurrection. Number one, it transforms our faith. It transforms our faith. When you stop and think about the disciples before the resurrection, and, and I might add too, not only the resurrection, but Pentecost. Pentecost takes place 50 days after the resurrection. 40 days after the resurrection is the ascension, where Jesus goes back to be with his Father in heaven, he sits at the right hand, he sends it on Pentecost, he sends the Holy Spirit to indwell the believer, to have this baptism of the Holy Spirit, to put us all in the same body. A lot is going on, but it is, it is going to be uh, during this time in our lives, and when we say the power of uh, the, the, the transformation of our faith, it is not just the resurrection, it is the Pentecost, it is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But we think about them, what were they like in, even in the days in which they walked with Jesus? Well, there, there was a lot of fear in their lives, and certainly after the cross, there was a lot of fear. After the cross, we, we, look, at the, we look at Jesus and we look at his mother and we realize that there were only two, there were probably more, but two women there. But the only disciple was John. All the rest of them were hiding. All the rest of them we're there. Even these disciples were known by their doubt. We had hoped, we had hoped he was the one 
that would redeem Israel. But, you know, uh, our hopes have been dashed and uh, they were filled with doubt and, and also confusion. We thought, we thought for sure this Jesus was uh, of Nazareth was going to be the, the Redeemer, that he was going to be the Messiah. And we're confused. Why wasn't it? Just, it wasn't a death crucifixion. Shame was not in their vocabulary when they thought about who Jesus would be. And then the shame that they went through. Peter, Peter is trying to get close. He, he's already denied that he even knows Jesus. And a little girl says, to Peter, standing there during the trial of Jesus. Hey, aren't you one of them? You've got that accent. Uh, you know about accents, right? That uh, uh, we, we tend to have a southern accent sometimes. You may have a northern accent. We were in uh, Denver, Colorado, when, uh, after we, we, get, we were married, and I was stationed in there for a little while. And Shelley's mother had always collected bills, and... Uh, Little ceramic bells. How many of you know, remember those little ceramic bells, gift shops and all? Anyway, she used to collect them. She'd give them to her mother. And so Shelly went into a gift shop. We went into a gift shop there in Denver, Colorado. And Shelly went up to the lady and said, do you have bales? <laughs> and the lady said, do we have what? <laughs> Shelly said, do you have bales? And the lady said, you mean like bales of hay? She said... No, ding dong bales, <laughs> just with that su precious southern accent. We all have accents, and this woman, this uh, young girl at at the, around the fire, says, "Hey, your accent betrays you. You're one of the followers of Christ." And and the Bible says he literally cursed, and then he went out. The Bible says with tears and so ashamed. In fact. When we see the, uh, uh, another resurrection appearance beside the Sea of Tiberias where they've all gone fishing and Peter comes in and, and uh, it, it, just imagine the feeling that he had, the shame, the embarrassment, the humiliation of having denied. But after the resurrection and the day of Pentecost, what happens to these uh, disciples? Well, there's a boldness there. I think of Peter, a great example we talked about the, uh, the reality of, of the shame and uh, the, the fear, the confusion. Peter denies to a little girl that he even knows who Jesus is. And yet on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, is going to stand before a crowd, literally of thousands, and he's going to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ. And not only is he going to proclaim Jesus Christ to be the living Son of God and the resurrected Son of God, he's going to say, this Jesus whom you slew. Say, so what was the reaction? The reaction was 3,000 of them got saved. 3,000 of them got baptized and the church was born on that day with 3,000 people and 120 up to that point, roughly. And there's this boldness that we can only imagine. There was a tremendous unity in their lives. They were marked by unity. They were marked ultimately by love. We hear stories and it's been often quoted that that they knew they were Christian. People knew that they were Christians by their love, by the unity of the Spirit, the love they had one for another. And that's one of the greatest challenges we here at Faith Baptist Church want to always emphasize that it's not about having 400 people in our church service. It's about loving people. It's about caring for people. It's about sharing the gospel. It's about being on this journey together. None of us have arrived and, uh, and, and when God brings people, we, we remember in the days we used to pray and we said, Lord, uh, we pray that you would make us a church that you were comfortable in sending lambs to us. That we could help disciple people who, who were on the road and who were struggling with, uh, with, with addictions and struggling with uh, heartbreak and struggling with doubts and that we would love them to Jesus just like somebody loved us to Jesus. Amen. And we want to be that church. We, know that we ought to just always determine that's the kind of church we want to be and will not. And then, of course, self-sacrifice. 
We look at the lives of the disciples, these who were not even present at the cross, except for John. Except for John, they're all going to die a martyr's death. What makes that transformation, what makes a coward into a, into a hero of the faith? What makes a, what makes a, a, a fisherman who is uh, fairly illiterate, what makes him turn into a bold witness for Jesus Christ? It's the transforming power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're here this morning and you may be saying, oh, I wish I had, we talked about getting some help for setting up tables. We talk about the uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. We're going to have an opportunity at Amherst to uh, work with about, uh, I can't remember how many, uh, how many different schools and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. We're going to feed them and we're going to share Jesus Christ with them. And maybe you're thinking, I could never do that. We don't, don't limit God as to what you can and can't do. If you are doing what you can do within your own power and your own abilities and your own talents, God's not in it. But when we step out by faith and say, God, use me, he's going to give us a power. He's going to give us a wisdom. He's going to give us a passion to move in certain areas. Peter before, before Easter and then Peter after my goodness, this realization of, of the difference. Uh, Keith Ramsey came up to me and he said, he said, Pastor, he said, April 7th, 1997, today, 27 years ago today. I said, what? He said, I got saved. Praise the Lord. You know, and I look at, and I look at Keith and I'll say, and it, by the way, Keith is the drummer with our praise group. And I've known Keith for many, many years. And God is, not only did he transform him on that day when he got saved, he continues to transform Keith. He continues to transform you. He continues to transform me. None of us are where we ought to be. None of us are who we, who, who we wish we were. But we're on this journey. And let's lock arms together. And let's go in that direction, believing in the transformation that comes with walking through him. The power of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit will transform your vocabulary. Instead of cursing, uh, you, you, you will, you will you'll have praises on your lips. It will transform your habits. It will give you victory over your addictions. Your love for the word and your love for, uh, for spiritual things will be transformed by this renewing that comes with the resurrection power in our lives. Our pocketbooks and our checkbooks will be transformed. You know the old story, and I know a lot of people have told that, that the fellow got baptized and he had his street pants on and, and uh, he, he went under and the preacher brought him back up and the guy said, oh no, he said, I accidentally left my wallet in my pocket when I got baptized. Preacher said, that's okay, you are. wallets need to get baptized too. And uh, the spirit of giving, the spirit of generosity, and the resurrection transforms our faith. It transforms us. It will transform your family. The resurrection of Jesus Christ will transform your family. As we lead our families into the paths of righteousness, as we lead our families into God's house on Sundays, as we lead our families back on Wednesday nights for Bible study, for children's ministry, for teens ministry, for young marriage ministry, and all these opportunities. You realize we have almost as many people on a Wednesday night here as we do for Sunday school on Sunday morning. We've got a good crowd that comes out. for, But they're coming out because the, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit has placed a holy hunger in them to, to know God's word and to fellowship with the saints that we are blessed and we are surrounded with. And then number two, and I, I love this when I, when I saw this, did a little study. It transforms our hunger for the word of God. If we're really saved and if we really have that resurrection power of Jesus Christ and that resurrection has transformed us, it's going to give us a whole new approach to, and a whole new love for the word of God. Uh, look what, look what, how it convinced the disciples. I'm going to give you really three places here that we're going to look at what Jesus did as he's walking with them on the road to 
to Emesis. And uh, and in Luke chapter 24, verses 6 through 8, the great message is, He is not here, He is risen. And then he reminds him, he says, remember how he spoke to you and he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. He went back to the word of God. Remember what the word of God said. Remember what Jesus said. Remember what Jesus proclaimed. And then in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27, It says, then he said to them, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe and all the prophets have spoke. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. First five books of of the Bible are the Pentateuch, all written by Moses. And he began, I'm sure, no doubt, started talking even in the very beginning when when Adam and Eve were were being uh, kicked out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin. The Bible says that God himself slew the animals and put the skins on him, sending a message, beginning to teach a lesson that ultimately because of sin, the the innocent would have to die for the guilty. And on the cross of Calvary, the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ himself, he who was absolutely innocent, he knew no sin, but he became our sin. He took our punishment. He took our death and he rose again. He was the lamb. I personally, even though Genesis doesn't tell us what kind of an animal or animals they were, I personally believe they were probably lambs. Uh, A lamb being this perfect illustration of, of the helpless, the the weak, the innocent. And yet Jesus Christ, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And they are saying, The Word of God said, The Word of God said, The Word of God said that that He would suffer and that He would rise again on the third day. And then Luke 24, verses 44 through 46. And some of these, we're going to actually go through them twice. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. We're back to those five books. And the prophets, all of the major prophets and the minor prophets, and the Psalms, the wisdom literature. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And then he said to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. You and I, we, are, we live in a, a world that's filled with doubt a world in which there are no absolutes, a world in which we are, we are told lie upon lie upon lie upon lie. And uh, we struggle sometimes to understand. We struggle sometimes to know what is truth. And the transforming power of the resurrection and the Pentecost remind us that God's word is true no matter what. This week we were uh, this week we were up there at, at uh, the Ark Encounter and uh, again how many of you ever be, have ever been there and, and went through it? All right, good good number have and I really encourage the rest of you. But I, it is it is it is full of scientific proof that uh, evolution is is a lie and that creation is true. And and it, it is it is there. It's everywhere. Again, we don't just we're not just uh, we're, we're not just uh, idiots who just believe a, a, a fantasy or a fairy tale. Uh, we we believe it because because God said it. I I, uh, I I thought to myself, when did I become a creationist? I, I'm a, that was a evolutionist, I'm sure, uh, through school and even through some of the liberal colleges that I I went through. I'm sure uh, I got I became a creationist the moment I read Genesis one one. I became, I became a creationist. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, I'm wrong about everything else. Everything else is a lie. God did it. Amen. He created the heaven and the earth. And I read a little further and I see he did it in six days. 
So now I'm not only a creationist, I'm a young earth creationist. And not billions of years, not uh, trillions of years, but uh, probably six to 8,000 years ago, God created the earth. He created it in six days. He rested on the seventh. And I believe it because the Bible teaches it. And I've never had a doubt and I've never struggled with, well, it really could be that, could it be that simple? And it is that simple because we're that simple and faith is supposed to be that simple where we believe God. Listen, if Genesis 1-1 is not true, then John 3-16 is not true. You can't guarantee God loves you. You can't even guarantee there's a God. If you can't say God created the heavens and the earth, it's all, that is, the, that is a cornerstone of our faith, our belief, and our doctrine that God created all things. And because he created all things and he did what he said he was going to do, I believe that John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I believe that's true. And because I believe Genesis 1.1, I believe the cross is true. That the sinless Son of God died and paid the ransom for my sin, my wickedness, my rebellion. Because I believe Genesis 1.1, I believe that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he bodily came out of that grave. The disciples didn't steal his body. Jesus Christ walked out of that grave. I believe, why do you believe it? Because God said it in the scriptures. And because I'm going to believe God over anybody else. I believe that not only the resurrection, I believe that we are mandated to go into all the world and take the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I believe Genesis 1.1. I believe Jesus is coming back. Because I believe Genesis 1.1. And, in a, and if, if Genesis 1-1 is not dependable and true, then I can believe nothing else in the scriptures. I have told this story here before, but uh, when I was a fairly young Christian, and began to feel a tug on my heart about ministry. And uh, I, I, was, uh, I was 22 and I got saved and I just thought, man, I'm, I'm so old, I'll just never have any chance, you know, I'll never, I'll never grow up spiritually. And the kids would sit in Community Baptist Church, Shelley, and they'd love to sit next to me because when they would say, the pastor would say, turn to the book of Esther. Well, I had no idea where the book of Esther was. I had no idea there was a book of Esther. And uh, the kids would grab my Bible and they'd find it for me. They just thought, this is great. Um, his sergeant in the Air Force doesn't know where Esther is, and we do. And they just, they'd, they'd give it to me. And I, so I tried so hard. I, I learned to pick up lingo, things that Christians are supposed to say. And uh, I remember one, there was a song, I don't know if it was a Gaithers or what, but basically it said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Do you ever remember that song? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. We had an evangelist came to the church one time, and a pastor introduced me to him, and, and uh, the guy said, so you, you feel like God's calling you to the ministry? And I said, well, y yes, I, I do. And and uh, we talked for a few moments, and then he asked a question, I don't remember what it was, but I remember looking at him and saying, you know, God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. And he looked at me, and he stuck his finger right in my face, and he said, young man, let me tell you something. God said it, and that settles it whether you believe it or not. God said it. That settles it whether we believe it or not. We believe that. We believe that. The Word of God. Look at Acts chapter 17, verse 11, talks about, and this is my vision, this is my desire, this is my prayer for, for Faith Baptist Church. It says that uh, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. He's talking about the, the Berean believers. He said, uh, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. That's my desire that every, every, every person under the sound of this voice and you that are studying the word, uh, who are listening by, <clears throat> listening by Facebook Live, that every one of us dur during the day, we're searching the scriptures. We're not just relying on what the preacher tells us. I mentioned earlier that many of us know what we believe 
or we know what we think we believe, but we may not know how we know we believe what we believe what we do. We need to know the Word of God. This morning we launched the uh, Foundations of Faith. Many of you are in Sunday school. Uh, Not all the Sunday school classes did it yet, but uh, you were in and you got a booklet called Milk and it had eight doctrines that every Christian should know. And we are learning in Sunday school. We're learning to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. We're learning the Word of God. Our faith will increase. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We'll live in obedience because thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. And we're going to, in eight weeks of studying the milk booklet and completing the study at home and having your Sunday school, you're going to know more, and this isn't why we're doing it, but you're going to know more than 90% of Christians in America. We are desperately illiterate to what the Bible actually says. So I want you to dig in to, dig into the milk booklet, dig in and uh, uh, just grow and watch what God does and how he transforms us. And then number three, number three, it transforms our purpose. You ever play the game when when you were young? Uh, What do you want to be when you grow up? You want to be a fireman? You wanted to be a a banker, you wanted to be a chef, you wanted to be, you wanted to be married, you wanted to have children, you wanted to, and, and, and most of us grew up wanting, and we'd say that's our purpose in life. I think this is what I'm going to do. But the reality is the power, of the transforming power of the resurrection and the, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost tells us that God has a different purpose for us. Listen to these words. We've read them before. Luke 24, 46 through 49. Then he said to them, speaking of Jesus, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. Now listen to this. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. After the, resu- after the cross... After the resurrection, our purpose becomes different. Our purpose doesn't mean you can't be a fireman, doesn't mean you can't be a chef, doesn't mean you can't be a mom, doesn't mean you can't be a dad, doesn't mean you can't be a mechanic. All these things are great. But ultimately, our purpose in life is going to be different. It's going to be uh, preaching and teaching the repentance and remission of sins in his name. God has given a message God wants us to share. God wants us to speak. God wants us to take that message and go all around the world. In fact, he says to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. He's going to clarify that on uh, the day of the ascension, uh, 40 days later. He's going to say this. He said, he says, but you're going to receive to the disciples, you're going to receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you're going to be witnesses of me both in Jerusalem and and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, be 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 the best mechanic, be the best teacher, be the best nurse, be the best doctor, be the best chef, be the best mom, be the best dad. But understand that our greater purpose, our higher purpose is to, is to magnify Jesus Christ, is to let the world know that there is remission of sins. So what is our purpose? And I'm just going to end with this one. Our purpose is to make Jesus famous and to make heaven crowded. You hear that? To make Jesus famous. The world thinks, and even here in Christian America, that Jesus is just a swear word. They have no idea who he is. Not the truth. Not the truth. Religion and, and, and Christians who are falsely call themselves Christians have painted such an ugly picture that most of the world wants nothing to do with Jesus Christ. God has called us to let the world know, beginning in Jerusalem, and that has been going on. You and I are here today because somebody in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ultimately went to the ends of the world because a missionary came and told us about Jesus. Our purpose is to make Jesus famous and to make heaven crowded. How do we do that? Well, our love for Jesus. Let our love for Jesus just glow, just radiate. Jesus said that we are to... Uh, we're, we're to let our, our, our works shine 
uh, so that others may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Our, our love for Jesus. And then not only our love for Jesus, but our love one for another. Again, in the early days, it was my how those Christians love one another. That's not what I hear too often. Too often I hear this. My, those Christians can't even get along with each other. Jesus prayed in the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17 that as his father and he were one, so he and us might be one and that we might be one together. So the world might know that God sent the son. Maybe one reason that we're not seeing people saved, maybe one reason that we're not seeing a, a to, the, to where we'd like to is because perhaps there's not the unity. And I do thank the Lord for the unity here at at this beautiful church. And then our lips. Our lips need to proclaim who he is. When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When was the last time you came and you knelt around an old-fashioned altar and you just said, Lord, for my son, for my daughter, my spouse, and just came and poured out your heart and asked God to save the lost? You see, not only is it our, our lips, but also our life. Somebody once said this. They said, you know, and, and it's just, it's a very popular saying, you know, preach the gospel and if you must, use words. Folks, don't say amen to that. We're not just to live good lives. We're to live good lives that, and by, the, by our mouth. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the mouth, we tell. Yes, our life needs to, to, to be above reproach. Our language needs to be above reproach. Uh, it all needs to be above reproach. But ultimately, it's going to come, here's the reason that I love the Lord. Here's the reason that I live for the Lord. Here's the reason that I want to share Jesus Christ with you. And then, ultimately, our legacy. Passing that faith on to our children and to our children's children. My daughter-in-law was on the trip uh, Lauren, and uh, she shared something she had seen. I guess it was on Facebook. It simply said this. It said that, that Noah had everybody, he had his family on the ark. And it simply said this, make sure your children are on the ark. If they're not on the ark, they're on the way to hell. You may send them to the best colleges. You may, you may set them up in business. You may teach them how to become multimillionaires. You may be able to do lots of things. But if our children die and go to hell, we have failed. And in this legacy, we pass our faith on to our children and our children's children. It said that 75% of, of teens, when they leave high school, never go back to church one more time. They're leaving the faith in droves. That's why I'm so glad that we're, we're going to be, we'll tell you more about it next week, but starting a class for, uh, for singles, young college and career, young people. And uh, it's Noel De Palma is going to raise your hand, Noel. And if you have any questions about it, ask, ask Noel. We'll be talking about it more next week. It's going to be exciting. We want to keep our young people. We want to pass this legacy of godliness we want to pass it down from generation to generation to generation. This morning, as we hear the challenge, I guess, for all of us is how do we make that resurrection enthusiasm, the transformation go week after week after week, year after year until ultimately Jesus Christ comes back. It should change our faith. It should change our love and dependency upon the word of God. And it should transform our very purpose. Pray for missionaries. Give to missions. Be a part of faith promise. And be faithful in what God has given us. And share Jesus Christ in here in our own Jerusalem. And then ultimately to the very ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer.